Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Um, it's my great pleasure today to introduce Jeff Green. Like many of us here at Lamont, the polar regions have always captivated and inspired Jeff. They are a homeland, a wilderness, a frontier, a laboratory, and what Jeff likes to call the greatest classroom on earth. Jeff is a global leader in polar education and youth engagement and the founder and president of the Students on Ice Foundation. And no, that is not a ice skating uh, <laughs> event. So Jeff, um, Jeff founded the Students on Ice um, in the 1990s during an Antarctic expedition that he was running for adult participants. He realized what an important impact having this polar experience was having and thought how this could impact youth in their formative years to shape their perspective about the earth and potentially motivate and inspire them as globally minded leaders and polar ambassadors. Well, for, you know, Fast forward ahead 20 years, Jeff has succeeded um, beyond his wildest dreams, I assume, although I know he's still incredibly ambitious of, of many more things yet to come. Um, he led his first student expedition in 2000 to Antarctica. And while we talk about organizing scientists as being like herding cats, I will tell you that's like a cakewalk compared to what Jeff does. I have witnessed it firsthand. In his most recent expedition, he had 130 high school and college students from around the world, many different cultures, many different languages on a ship with over 50% of them being from indigenous communities, many of them from cir circumarctic communities. And I will say that more than 90% of those expedition participants were also fully funded from generous donors that Jeff is able to inspire about the, the mission that he, that he undertakes. So from my, my perspective, I feel very lucky. About five years ago, Jeff asked our mutual friend, Peter Domenical, to sail as a guest scientist. Peter was too busy and suggested that Jeff ask me. And that led to one of the most, really one of the most meaningful and inspiring two weeks I've ever spent at sea. And that is, you know, within many, many months of being at sea. And I'm forever grateful to Jeff for that opportunity and for his ongoing friendship and for the students on ice community for making me more aware of the issues of equity, inclusion and justice faced especially by indigenous and first nation communities. Um, and, and this expedition five years ago was also the first place where I was really exposed to the principles of knowledge co-production and the value of indigenous knowledge in the scientific enterprise. And, and, and again, I really was grateful for having that, that, that perspective opened up to me. So I'll end by, say, by saying that Jeff has been recognized in many, many ways and honored in many, many ways, too numerous to recite here. But those recognitions do include being the first person to have water skied in both polar regions. <laughs> So, Jeff, thank you for coming. I don't want to take up any more of your time, and uh, I wish you could be here in person, but thank you for joining us virtually. Thank you very much, Mo. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing all those, those uh, recollections and, and those memories. Um, great to hear them. The, you could have probably kept the water ski thing a secret, <laughs> <laughs> but it uh, seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, way back when. Um, um, yeah, well, boy, thank you so much for asking me to speak today. It's a real, real honor. And I'm thrilled to be here with the Lamont community and the Columbia Climate School, particularly to speak to a group of people that are passionate about, about this issue, these challenges um, that we're facing as a planet um, and, the, and the planetary health that we need. In the, sh in the very short future ahead. So um, I'm looking forward to going on a bit of a journey with you guys over the next half an hour or so. I'm not sure where that journey is gonna take us, but hopefully uh, somewhere good and interesting. Um, and it might be able to share a few nuggets of, of information that will help you in what you're doing. Um, I want to also start 
by acknowledging that I'm speaking today, joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. Um, this is where I call home. It's where we work and play on the shores of the Gatineau River, which um, is uh, just north of Ottawa. So I'm in Quebec, Canada, um, in, our, in our headquarters here at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Gatineau, Quebec. So, um, well, um, maybe what, so I, over these last 30 years, Mo said a lot already, but I've had this real privilege to visit so many parts of planet Earth. Um, and, and in doing so, fall in love with the planet. I've, I've traveled over every ocean many times and been fortunate to go to the polar regions over 135 times. Um, the penguins recognize me now when I hit the beach and, and I'm recognizing them too, which is even a little more uh, concerning. But um, in doing so, it, it's, it's been a real eye opener to go to these, particularly to the, these windows of the, to the world, the polar regions. Um, cornerstones of the global ecosystem and symbols of peace and understanding and conservation. You, to, you know, two parts of this planet that are absolutely critical to life on Earth and to so much more. We, we, there's so much to learn from the polar regions, like the car battery you have. If both the poles aren't connected, our car doesn't start. And, and the polar regions have that similar effect, don't they, on planet Earth. Um, to begin the journey, I'm just going to share my screen, and, and I've got a few images and slides to share with you guys. So uh, let's see if this will work. Um, okay. Let me know if that, if you guys can see that. Is that looks great. Good? Okay, thanks, Phoebe. Um, I've, I've called the talk count to 10 and it's really um, to share a little bit about our plan for the next 10 years, this critical 10 years, this decade of impact that we, we really require on so many issues. And it, it, um, I'll, t I'll just take you down memory lane a little bit first. Um, I started leading these expeditions and to both the poles and around the world through the most of the 90s. And you're not supposed to hold the penguins, as you probably know, um, but I was working with some British scientists and they needed me to catch the penguins so they could tag their little, their little legs. And if you're wondering what it's like to hold a macaroni penguin, um, it's like a, a muscular rugby ball that like bites and poos on you nonstop. <laughs> and they bite really hard. Uh, this is uh, some king penguins. This one had so much to eat, it couldn't stand up. It was trying to get up to its nest to feed its chick, but it had such a full belly of krill, it couldn't, it couldn't even stand up, um, which was quite funny. Some of these other, like just moments of awe and wonder and beauty that we see in the natural world. This is a wandering albatross, the, the biggest seabird in the world. Uh, wingspan of up to four meters, 12 feet wide, a head as big as yours that can fly 5,000 nautical miles in a week soaring the Southern Ocean. Um, and, and here it was just gently nibbling on my fingers. And ag again, we were working with some British scientists on Bird Island in South, in South Georgia. Uh, quite a privilege. But, but these types of moments and looking into the eyes of a, of a polar bear um, change you they they touch your heart and that instills a connection with, with and it doesn't have to happen with these species it, it can it happens in so many ways with mother nature um, these polar bears they're really cute and cuddly until they try to eat you uh, so you do have to be we had a gopro on the end of a stick to get that shot off of our sailboat marine mammals the kings of queens of the Arctic. But of course, besides all those natural wonders, going to the polar regions also um, exposed me to the cultural wonders and the traditional knowledge of the, of the peoples of the Arctic, uh, in this case, Inuit, 
and the way the way of knowing the, the this deep deep way of knowing about place um, was such an eye opener something I had never been exposed to before in 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 my education career uh, where I grew up uh, and and it changed the way I look at a lot of, of things and I continue to learn um, from indigenous people across uh, Canada, but all across the circumpolar Arctic. This guy, this elder was born in an igloo. And at the end of his life, he was surfing the internet. It was, it's the greatest change in probably in any um, community in the history of, of, of the world. And it's happening here in the, in the Arctic and in both our backyards of, of you, the U S and Canada. And with that, of course, has come tremendous challenge uh, to, to make that change in such a short period of time. And I'll get to that in a bit, a bit later, but uh, the, that, that change has, of course, not been made easy due to a lot of the atrocities that have been committed by the Canadian government, amongst others, against Indigenous peoples. So all of these types of experiences... Um, I'd been a school teacher, I'd been an exhibition leader, and then one day on a beach, it, it just started, occurred to me, like, imagine if we could give that, these experiences to youth at the beginning of their life and how that would define their, their futures and change their perspectives and, and so much more. So Students on Ice was born thanks to many, many amazing people, organizations, governments, and... Um, uh, our logo really was meant to be the planet with the polar regions in the middle and a student standing on the pole. And our, that logo has kind of stuck with us right from day one. It, it, was, uh, it, it tells the story of what we're about, what our mission is, and, and what, our, what our vision is. And it, it does, in retrospect, it wasn't planned, but it does represent that intersection of humanity and nature. And then we're striving through what we do to find that sustainable, magical balance that we absolutely need. Our work begins in the greatest classrooms on earth, as Mo said, the, the mother nature, uh, in our case, the polar regions. And when we started Students on Ice, it was really kind of simplistic, I have to say. It was, let's, what a way to connect youth to nature. We weren't even, at least I wasn't, talking much about issues like climate change and biodiversity loss 22 years ago. Um, and now that's a front and center issue, of course, for all of our expeditions and our daily lives. A lot has changed in that 20 years. The program has become much more holistic. It's looking at mental health. It's flora, fauna, culture, climate change, biodiversity, marine protected areas, uh, blue economy, and, and so much more. It's, um, it's, we've tried to have it adapt and be relevant with the times. Um, so every year it's a little bit different. We use ships as our floating classrooms. And um, this is a typical group. We'll have anywhere from 50 to 150, even more sometimes, students and staff. And the ratio of students to staff is um, a two to one, one to two. No, two to one, one to two, <laughs> more students and staff, but, but uh, I think you get what I'm trying to say. And it, it's this uh, incredible mix and diversity of, of the planet. They're, they're youth, they're indigenous youth, inner city youth, kids from third world countries, first world countries. You'll put the boy from the Bronx into the same cabin on the ship as a boy from Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. And one never talks one never stops talking but they become best friends and, and this is where the magic really happens making these connections not just with nature but with with all of these different people and cultures from around the world if it was just a group of canadian youth or american youth we wouldn't it will wouldn't have the same discussions um, we wouldn't have those perspectives and and global youth together addressing global issues uh, we have found to be uh, part of the of the secret recipe. 
That's in Torngats, by the way, the Torngat Mountains, where Mo was with us, one of the most beautiful parts of the world, let alone Canada. Um, really, our mission is to inspire connection and empower leadership for a sustainable future, um, and doing that through youth. We, I hope, I think we also inspire a lot of older students, um, but yet it's the youth, of course, that we're after at that that really formative time in their in their lives. And the core, the key is touching their hearts. The youth today are bombarded with information. We all know that, we all are um, with these tools we, we have in our hands all the time. Uh, but touching someone in the heart is really when things become personal, commitment happens, change happens, uh, ideas are born. So um, that's quite simply the goal. And 90% of, of all our, our alumni, we've got now almost 4,000 alumni from 52 countries. They've said that their experience on these expeditions has changed the way they, they think about their career, but also their decisions to act on causes that they're passionate about. So yeah, like when you touch them in the heart, that's the key. And like, look at here, they're looking out over the Jakobshaven ice fjord in Alulasat, and I'm sure some of you have been there. It's like going to another planet uh, and looking at, at Earth differently. But you don't know what's going through their minds, but you know they're thinking about something they probably weren't thinking about when they were back home. Um, it, some youth are reduced to tears. It, these, these very powerful moments that, that shaped them. And they go on to do extraordinary things. Over those 22 years, and we track our alumni through an alumni program, they they become researchers, they become um, politicians, policymakers, they become musicians and artists and leaders in their communities. It, it's they invent stuff, they write books. It's endless, but but all of that is what's needed. It's that that full court press on on these issues that I think will will move the needle. And it is. It's just a quote from one of our students from India. Um, we have hundreds and hundreds of quotes like this. And I think we can all point to when we were youth and some of, some of you um, still are, um, how different experiences shaped who we are and the, and the paths we went down. Experiential education is the one thing that's proven, particularly environmental experiential education, it, that's proven to, to work. Um, how do we reach the masses? That is the challenge that I'll ask you in a second. So together with the students, there's this world-class team of remarkable people sharing their knowledge, their passion, their, their indigenous leaders, their scientists, their politicians, um, their business leaders, their, um, their people going for the right reason to share, their, to share their passion and to be mentors. And here's one pretty amazing climate uh, paleoclimatologist that you might recognize. Uh, of course, that's Mo uh, uh, giving a, a pretty amazing talk in the greatest classroom on earth with, look at that backdrop. Like how can you, how, what better place to teach about climate and ice than there? So it's about the people, the diversity of the educators and, and the youth the place, of course, is critical. The experience and giving that firsthand experience, climate change becomes real and personal in those moments. And then sending everyone home with a responsibility to make a difference in their communities and beyond. And, and that really does happen in so many ways. Over that 20 year journey, um, 50% of our youth now are Indigenous, um, Inuit, First Nation, Métis, Sami, Gwich'in. That's a, a kind of a benchmark for us now um, that we'll always um, continue to, to achieve, strive for. 80% um, of the students are fully funded by scholarships. So this is a program not for rich kids. Rich kids can go, but only 15 to 20% that can afford it. And that's intentional but the other 80% come from every, every corner of the planet, every background, 
and really we're just looking for passion and interest uh, to make a difference. They know this is an educational uh, scientific journey, uh, not a vacation. Um, we also use the, the, the ship journeys to reach a, a much broader global audience through virtual learning. And um, yeah, it's, uh, I can't even see all my screen here, but um, 52 countries total um, thus far in our, in our, in our 22 year history. Um, we also are really fortunate to be able to engage with global leaders. This is Prince Albert uh, of Monaco. He's the honorary chair of our board. And by, by it's, it's really effective, I think, to engage with these types of leaders. Obviously, we look for their, their financial support, but they, they're leaders of the present working with leaders of tomorrow. And the two together um, is, is so critical and important. And, and I, I'm very grateful to Prince Albert as a global leader for the ocean and for the polar regions. On the right here is Mary Simon. And Mary is the, one of the first people I went to talk to when I thought about students on ice. At the time, she was the Circumpolar Ambassador for Canada. And she immediately said, this is a good idea. We got to do this. Mary, just uh, about a month ago, was made the first Indigenous, uh, not just female, first Indigenous male or female Governor General of Canada. She's Inuk. She was born on the land um, in, in Nunavik in the Arctic. And she's just one of the most extraordinary people I know. And uh, she's you know, done, done all kinds of things in her life. But now as a Governor General of Canada, she's going to be um, continue that legacy of impact, um, particularly in this time in Canada where we're on this journey of, of truth and reconciliation. We're learning about some of the painful uh, truths of Canadian history that we didn't grow up knowing about, at least those of us that are non-Indigenous, but we're learning about it now. Um, the 215 graves of children that were just discovered at, outside of a residential school in Kamloops, BC. And that, that's just the beginning of more uh, um, graves, unfortunately, that, that will um, be, be found in, in the years to come. So Mary's role, I'm so excited and so proud um, to know her, but to have her in that role uh, here in Canada. And she's been on a lot of our expeditions and, and that's her husband, Whit Fraser who's uh, also just a salt of the earth guy. On each expedition, it's hands-on. We're drilling ice cores, we're walking on glaciers, we're out in zodiacs doing different marine um, research, marine biology, we're visiting communities. It's jam-packed every single day. Um, this is another thing we do a lot of, we'll, we sit around on the land and here we're listening to some elders, Inuit elders, whose ancestors used to live in these sod houses at, at the north end of Baffin Island. And so in these moments, like the, the, the learning goes so deep um, and the, the, the layers of learning and knowing uh, it's because you're looking at this now through hundreds, if not thousands of years um, and hearing it from, from, Inuit elders in this case that have a different perspective than a Western scientist. Um, just incredible learning moments. And then of course, we're engaging with a lot of the ongoing contemporary efforts like the SDGs, the Arctic Council, the COP climate meetings. We've sent delegations to every COP meeting since COP 11. I'm sad to say <laughs> that we've, you know, we've had to do that. We haven't got to to where we need to be quite yet. Let's hope COP26 coming up is going to, going to improve on that record. Um, my favorite SDG is, is number 14. And these youth are a movement. And, and this is a really significant point to make. And youth I'm talking, let's say 14 to 30. It, it's an impatient um, group. They, are, they want action, they want it now, and they're there very, very powerful. We're seeing how they can shape the planet. Um, 
but we need to support that as much as we possibly can. Um, so we're doing that through our work with students on ice because these, these are, as we said, formative years to lead to active change, but not just formative for the youth, they're formative for our planet. I just wanna show you a short video. And this is an example of how that youth voice can is so powerful. This video is entirely written and produced and made by, by youth on our expedition um, two years ago, just before COVID. And it screened to world leaders at the UN General Assembly um, in New York a couple of years ago at the Blue Leaders meeting. Um, Greta was in the front row watching this when we first showed it. For every two breaths you take, one of them comes from the ocean. 50% of the world's oxygen comes from right here. Right here. Right here. Two breaths. One from the ocean. One. Two. The ocean is the base of life on our planet. But our oceans are threatened. They're sick. They're dying. And not just the ocean. Our biodiversity. Our climate. Our nature. Our culture. Our planet. Ourselves. If you're watching this. A person with power and the ability to change the world. Then do better. Do better. Do better. If you're sitting in your house or office, shielded from the effect of climate change, then do better. Then do better. If you've turned a blind eye towards what's happening in this world, then open your eyes and do better. People without voices are fighting to get a voice. So if you already have a voice, then do better. I am the change. I am the change. I am the change. You can be the change. You can be the change. You can be the change. We will all be the change. We will all be the change. We will all be the change. Be the change. Two breaths, one from the ocean. So being an ocean-based program in the polar regions, a, a natural connection, of course, has been that link between the oceans and, and the cryosphere and, and between climate and ocean health and planetary health. Um, green needs blue. <laughs> the green economy needs the blue economy. Uh, the IPCC report, as you guys know, that came out recently shows how critical ocean health is to life on land. Um, so that's a big focus of, of ours. And, and one of the areas we're, we're especially focused in to right now is indigenous led uh, marine conservation areas in the Arctic. There's been some great achievements in the last five years. Um, that, and we've been fortunate to be a small part of a few of those. And there's a lot more to come, especially with this global effort to reach 30% of our ocean and land protected by 2030. And here in Canada, we've set a separate target of 25% protected by 2025, which is just around the corner. And this will not happen without Indigenous-led efforts, which we're um, thankful are happening. This is a decade of impact. It's so critical the next 10 years. Um, and the, I don't need to, I'm preaching to the converted here. We're not even at 10, now we're down to eight. It's almost 2022. Um, we need to get on a pathway by 2030, um, or it may be too late to get on that pathway. Uh, moving towards things like net zero, 
um, reducing biodiversity loss. And, and you know, wouldn't it be amazing if we could reach something uh, uh, resembling full recovery by 2050? My kids are nine and 13. 2030, they're going to be um, 19 and 20, 23, 22. So like th these are not, these are small time frames, and we've got to take action. Um, we'd have no more time to waste. If the last 10 years has achieved anything, uh, uh, it's helping understand the environmental crisis, the next 10 has to achieve real meaningful shared action. And there's a lot of progress. I see it all the time. I see it through youth. It's why we do what we do. Um, if we weren't hopeful, um, and see, if we didn't see the innovation uh, happening on so many levels, uh, I, I don't know if I'd be able to, you know, come into the office every day. But politically, economically, um, there's so many things, great things are that are happening. Um, the sustainable blue economy has got to be a piece of the puzzle. Uh, Indigenous-led, not just conservation but economies, is critical. Uh, renewable energies and and so much more. Um, it's a time of innovation and, and the pace of change can, is so great that we can't imagine uh, some of the things that are possible two, three, four, uh, definitely not 10 years from, from now. So that's where we derive a lot of the, the, the vision and mission and, and hope. This old model of the sustainable blue, or sorry, the sustainable um, development where sustainability kind of fit there in the middle of environment, society, and economy, I think is wrong. This should be the new model where everything is interdependent, but without environment, we don't have, without a healthy environment, we don't have society and we don't have the economy. So it's a different shift. It's a way of looking at things differently. It's not revolutionary. This goes back to indigenous um, beliefs of Turtle Island, of the seven indigenous teachings. Um, incorporating that indigenous knowledge is such an important way forward. Um, and we can't have reconciliation without reconciling our relationship with planet Earth. Um, and the list goes on of reasons. A healthy planet, a healthy environment is good for business. It's, you know, not having clean air, clean water and clean earth and food is just like, how did we lose the plot on that not being the top priority. It, it's what it, it, it's what uh, our species requires to survive. So shifting a, a bit of a cultural paradigm um, where we're not competing with nature, um, but we're living within it is, is absolutely required. Um, we're, we're living in this society, most of us anyway, that's very disconnected from the natural world. Some of you may have read Richard Love's book that came out over a decade ago called The Last Child in the Woods and it defined the term nature deficit disorder. Well, that deficit disorder is, is uh, it's another, uh, we need, <laughs> yeah, I think the vaccine is, exists for that one. Um, it's, it's getting connected and, and respecting and loving nature. Um, and how do we do that? Well by bringing the greatest classrooms on earth to the world. But that's the challenge. And, and I don't know the answer. How do we make place-based learning, which we know works in nature, become nature-powered learning at scale? How do we use these potentially as tools to make people fall in love with the natural world and, and take the action and the behavior change that's needed? Um, with virtual learning, with AI, with AR, with DR, maybe. Um, I, I think it's got to be part of the solution. It's one of the areas that we're focused on as a, as a, as an organization, um, as a tool. Um, we'll be working with a few groups next year, like National Geographic, trying to reach those audiences. So taking experiential learning, using tech, brands, media to create immersive learning that can reach that audience down below and others in a, in a really, meaningful way because we can't take everybody to the arctic and the antarctic we know that we don't want to um and so many of our of, of, uh, of the, the planet's population are living in urban environments clearly so how do we how do we make those connections and touch those hearts 
because we want to put we want putting the planet first to become second nature for all. In 2017, um, we did this for Canada in a way. Um, we were celebrating Canada's 150th anniversary of Confederation, and to help celebrate that, we decided to sail around every inch of Canada's coastline. We called it Canada C3, uh, stood for coast to coast to coast. It, we also realized pretty soon into the journey, it also stood for crazy, 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 because what a journey it was. It, it was 150 days, 25,000 kilometers. We left Toronto on the 1st of June, got to Victoria, BC on the 28th of October, and you know through the St. Lawrence, around the Maritimes, up the the coast of Labrador, Baffin, through the Northwest Passage, all the way around Alaska, 22 days to, just to get around Alaska, and then a month down the BC coast. From the time we left the tip of Newfoundland until the time we got to the tip of Vancouver Island, we were exclusively an indigenous community. That's 70% of Canada's coastline is exclusively indigenous community. That's, that's not a narrative that we know in this country, but it's true. Um, those indigenous people and communities have been the, the guardians, the gatekeepers, the, the stewards of our coastlines. Uh, and for that part of our, of our, of, well, now what we call Canada. Um, for the, so it, it's a game changer. And this journey became one of, of a lot of emotion, um, a lot of learning, learning parts of our history we didn't know. Um, in some cases, people couldn't believe it, um, but but it sank in pretty quick. And it, it was also just an incredible ad adventure, um, just seeing that, seeing the coastline. We used a little icebreaker called the Polar Prince. And that's a, a mobile laboratory container on the right. It was a journey of science. It was a journey of youth engagement. It was a journey of of um, all kinds of, of issues looking at our past, present, future. But more than anything, it was a journey of reconciliation. Here we are locked in the ice somewhere up, uh, I think that's off Baffin Island. It was just an extraordinary experience for everybody. And this is usually how the day started and how the day ended with a sharing circle where everyone uh, passed the talking stick or the microphone and shared and there we had newcomers to Canada, immigrants, we had Canadians with disabilities, we had indigenous um, uh, people uh, of, from all across Canada, we had youth, we had scientists, we had politicians, business, but like you name it. And it was that diversity and that inclusion that, that changed all of us. It, we brought a, a different collection of people on board every 10 days. So 15 legs of, of 10 days each. And I mean, if we could take everybody on a journey like this, it would, it would, it would change the world. How do we do that? I don't know, but uh, it was also a journey of science. Here we are doing environmental DNA. Uh, we did that every day around the country. Um, we had musicians like Pat Watson on board. Um, we touched and reached out to youth. We reached millions of people around the world through the, um, all of the, the website and Facebook lives and everything else that we did every day. Um, we opened hearts and minds and God, that's what it's about, isn't it? Um, even if it's not firsthand, you can do it like this in a classroom. Of course, we learn so much from indigenous people. I cannot understate that. Um, this is Roger Hitkaluk and Roger um, is from uh, Kugukuk Nunavut. He's 70 years old. He was 70, now he's 75. But Roger started telling us about an island way in the middle of nowhere in the Northwest Passage that he was stranded on with his family when he was six years old for three months. Their boat got wrecked and they had to wait for freeze up to get back across the ice back to the mainland. So I heard this story. I'm like, what? You lived there for three months? We're going, we got to go there. Where is this place? So we found it. And this is what we found. Um, we put the ship right on the beach, very remote place. You can see these terraced beaches representing past sea level. 
uh, I'm, I'm guessing because of, of the, the, the rebound of this island since the last glacial period, we found a part of, of Roger's dad's boat left there 60 years, over 60 years ago on the beach. We walked up that terrace beach and we found a cairn. And in that cairn was a note left behind by a sailors that had been stranded there over 30 years ago in a storm. Turned out I know the guy's brother that wrote the note, which shows you what a small world this is and how interconnected it is. But then to top it all off, like here we were celebrating 150 years of Canada, but we looked around and we were standing amongst middle Dorset ruins of, of a people that had lived on that island 3,500 years previously. It really put into perspective, you know, time and, and how things change. And we were walking in the footsteps of people that had been there thousands of years ago, but we thought we were, you know, celebrating this colonial uh, 150 years. It changed, it, experiences like this really changed uh, the way we looked at everything. This is Gu Zhao. Gu Zhao is from, he's Haida from Haida, Haida Gwai. And um, he fought to protect those old growth forests of Guayhanas. He, he and others chained themselves to those trees to, to protect from loggers. And they were successful. Guayhanas today is an incredible uh, 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 nat national park and protected area. Um, if you ever get a chance to visit, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary, but it's individuals like this that were inspired, that were connected, that fought um, for what they believed in and what they know, knew was critical. And, and that's happening to this day still, unfortunately, we're still trying to protect these old growth forests. Quite often we'd come ashore and I'd be met by the chief. This is Chief Ch Ted of uh, the Awikano on the Rivers Inlet. And he greeted us and said, we're not celebrating Canada 150, but welcome. <laughs> and, and so it was like that trust, that relationship building. That's the key, isn't it, in everything. If you're a scientist wanting to work in the North with indigenous community, and you've got to build the trust. You've got to have the relationship. And it takes time, and it's not easy. Um, but that is the absolute key. Nothing happens in these places now, uh, particularly in the Arctic without the blessing of the Inuit, without their endorsement and without their engagement, the consultation um, and then leadership. It's just simply, it, it's a different time. It's a better time, I think, than the way it used to be. And here we are welcomed into the big house with Chief Ted. Um, you know, just, I, I, I have lots of words really to describe these moments. So in 2022, just to wrap up, um, we're hoping to do it again for the planet. And we're launching a 10 year, well, now it's eight year, COVID slowed us down a little, uh, expedition series to accelerate amongst other things, a billion acts of change. Um, so a, a, a number of programs in both the Arctic and the Antarctic, but places in between. And um, fostering that uh, connection to the natural world, but also harnessing that we don't know quite yet, and I'd love to ha hear any ideas you guys have. How do we reach that broader audience, that global network of, of youth and leaders and media, and government um, policymakers, you name it? So we're pretty excited about this. We're going to use this ship that we've chartered for the next uh, uh, three to five years. Uh, it's the only privately owned icebreaker in Canada. It used to be a Coast Guard vessel. It's called the Polar Prince. I love it. Um, it's a, such a great platform, and, and uh, we'll be using that starting this June. That's a huge tabular iceberg off the coast of Baffin that's broken off the Greenland ice cap, ice cap clearly, and drifted down and got stuck. Um, a billion acts of change. How do we get there? Well, we've got this metric. Um, who knows? If we get to half a billion, that'd be pretty good too, or maybe more, um, but it's it's... It's a partnership vision. We we love partnerships. It makes the world go round. And um, an act of change can really be big or small. Anything that models leadership or stewardship for the health of the planet. 
Uh, and a lot of that's going to be around behavioral change. It's also going to be te technological change. It's policy. It's ways of knowing. Um, there's so many, so many opportunities that are out there if we really strive for them. We don't have to settle for the way we've done things in the past. So looking ahead, um, and we'd love to work with, I mean, I, I'm definitely hoping Mo is going to join us again, but many of you um, listening today would love to work with you, have you involved in some way. We're launching a series of polar schools uh, starting in March, which will be land-based programs. Uh, the first one will be at the Canadian High Arctic Research Station in Cambridge Bay, Nunavut. Um, our icebreaker expeditions. Blue Futures Pathways is a program connecting youth to the opportunities of the sustainable blue economy that we're, we started two years ago. Um, NLEAP is Northern Leaders Engaged in Arctic Policy, uh, Circumpolar Arctic Policy. So really um, uh, taking what's out there and showing youth how they can be a part of that discussion and that um, career, that leadership. Expedition to Community is a program we have in five communities across the Arctic right now. It's, um, it's youth-based community-led projects that we support. Definitely want to get back to Antarctica. So we're planning a global youth leaders expedition. Uh, we don't have a date yet, but soon. And I'd encourage you all to, to, to check out the soibridge.com. It's a virtual platform that we started in COVID uh, to share information, stories, videos, interviews, et cetera. And the next um, edition will be focused on Nunavut. And lastly, supporting Indigenous-led research and conservation, because um, uh, we have so many Indigenous partners, um, and we, we just want to do what we can to, to, to support uh, all of that great work that's going to, going to be done in the years to come. And that's all for me for now. I'd love to answer any questions and thanks for, uh, thanks for listening. Cool. Well, um, you, you, you haven't been resting during the pandemic. Your ambitions are bigger than ever, and it's wonderful. So there definitely are some questions here, and I would encourage, I, I think what we're doing is, is looking in the Q&A pane for questions, folks. Um, and I'll just start at the top here. There's one from Lauren who is asking, were any of the Indigenous people presumably that you've interacted with reluctant to engage with you or the students yeah, well yeah boy um thanks lauren i mean sometimes the students themselves are are reluctant they're they're it it, it varies in many cases these are youth that have never been out of their community um so they're they're shy uh they're in a big city, maybe for the first time on their way to join the act. So we started a program called Savitut, which um, is kind of an acclimatization program. And it, it's made a huge difference. Uh, I won't get into the details of it, but it's like a three day, four day program before joining the expedition. And it's really helped a lot. Um, but the, the path of good intention to places like the Arctic um, is paved with it's paved, paved with disasters. And, it, and that's because, you know, so often people went north thinking they knew what was best. They had the answers, they had the project and they just needed the help or they needed to interview somebody about client. And, and that's, so, so there is an apprehension as a result of that history, uh, not to mention some of the much more horrible, difficult history to engage, absolutely. And that's where the trust factor is key, being patient, consulting. Um, before you ever start anything or, or do anything, um, partnerships is, is uh, uh, and don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Do not underestimate um, 
the, the, the knowledge, the capacity, the, the ability, because um, you'll be proven wrong every time. So yeah, that's a long, uh, a, an issue that I can talk a lot about, but for sure, um, there's some reluctance. So another person is asking, um, do you know if there are similar programs to this that focus on old growth forests, geology, oceans, et cetera, that similarly em emphasize financial accessibility and indigenous participation, which might be the same as asking, have you inspired other organizations to, to achieve this kind of impact in this way? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, whether we've inspired them or not, we're the, we're the, as far as I'm aware, we're still the only organization that has consistently operated with youth in the, both the polls for so long. There are some other amazing programs all over the world, uh, outdoor education programs, uh, environmental education programs. I mean, summer camps um, for kids, certainly, and canoe camps. And these all are, are so vital and important and, and life-changing for, for youth. So there are, if you, if you look around, you will find um, they're not all as financially accessible, I don't think, because that is a big nut to crack. <laughs> we, we're a charitable foundation in the US and in Canada. And it's through that and our, our emphasis on fundraising partnerships from governments, from corporations, from philanthropists, that we've been able to um, make it happen, but it's not easy. It's a, it's a epic job. Um, uh, so, and it's always, it's a cyclical, something we're always battling and working against. Yeah, um, Fatima asks, can students apply to join an expedition? Yeah, Fatima, 100%. COVID's kind of shut us down in, in terms of expeditions for the last almost two years. But if you watch our website in for the next month, um, by the end of October, we will be um, launching all of the programs for 2022. And, and it's easy to apply. There's different application processes, but we can walk you through that depending on where you live and what students you're thinking of. And then of course, we also are always looking for awesome staff uh, experts to to join we have amazing grad students and postdocs who are have deep roots in the world of mentorship as well and i'm sure they'd be thrilled to be involved um yeah. i have a question have you managed to sorry have you managed to invite greta to come um yes and as you probably know greta um won't fly uh you know which is which is awesome it's really hard to get to the arctic and antarctic without flying you could sail there and she did sail of course across the atlantic last year and and back but logistically it's it's not really feasible for greta also we're still using for the ship-based programs fossil fuel burning vessels and and I don't think she'd ever get, hop on board one of those. It's something we are, uh, as an organization, very aware of. We have all the different offset programs that we've been doing that since for 20 years before offsets were offsets. But we are looking ahead to new technologies, um, vessels, engines that one day soon, ho hopefully will not require fossil fuels and starting next summer we're going to be experimenting with this um, really low carbon fuel so there's a bunch of stuff we're, we're working on right now but um i i did get a chance to meet greta and uh i mean hallelujah <laughs> for her and what she's continuing to do and i think in your answer you you answered most of the last question which is you, you know, the conflict between the carbon footprint of flying to the Arctic or the Antarctic. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, 
I, we've looked at that issue constantly and it becomes a, a balance first uh, of, of um, is, is, or is the good outweighing the bad? Yeah. And, and in our case, we've, we've felt quite clearly that we're still, we're still on the positive side of, of that, the impact we're having. Um, but yeah, we, I mean, I, I wish we did, we did do an expedition on a sailboat, but we can only take eight kids at a time. Um, so we'll see what the future holds that we just moved away from using large vessels like the one that you came on Mo and starting in, in uh, 2022, we're only going to use small expedition research vessels. So our, they're much more COVID friendly and climate friendly. Um, and then we're going to just keep that emphasis on making sure we, there's a great environmentalist here in Canada named David Suzuki that you might know of or heard of. And 17 years ago, David said, you're burning a lot of goddamn fossil fuels green. You better make sure you're making a goddamn difference. <laughs> and, that, and that stuck with me uh, big time. So I, I wish I had a, more of an answer, but that's that's what I've got right now. I, I wanted to mention too, Mo, that I know many of you are in New York and for the last 18 years, we've had a program that takes one student from each borough of New York City on our expeditions every year. And so if you know anybody in the Bronx, Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, et cetera, um, every single year we have at least a, one scholarship for students from those boroughs. Pretty cool. So hopefully this decade of change will also bring new technologies to power the ships. It, it has to, it, shipping, shipping is right now um, a, a massive part of, of the global emissions, but it's destined to be about 15% of the global emissions. If it were a country, it would be the largest emitter in the world. And, and so we, we need solutions there. They're being worked on. Um, but not fast enough. And there are uh, there are electric boats out there. Um, uh, there's a new cruise ship that was just launched by a Norwegian company that has a, a hybrid engines, par partially battery powered. So so we just need to accelerate that, that yeah. transition. Jeff, thanks so much. It's hey, lovely. thanks everybody inspiring and phoebe thank you for for moderating in the background there thank you everyone <laughs>